Okay, I think it's time to get started, and thank you all for coming. Probably most of you have been to at least one or two or all three of the previous talks, and we've had three really good speakers as we brought in experts from our own neighborhood, really, to uh, come and speak with us. And so our final evening, we save the best for last, of course, is Father Terry Grachinen. He's the pastor of St. Noel's for how many years now? Five years, holy cow, time does fly. And uh, he's a great young priest. He has a lot of gifts, and one of them is his love of art, and I believe you have a degree in art, don't you? From his college days and graduate days. And so we're in for a really good final Lenten lecture. So let's welcome Father Terry to the hall. Thank you, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you here this evening, although I don't know they should have saved this for last. So I hope you enjoyed the first three. Um, my only real tie to Immaculate was uh, my time in the seminary. I met Father Pat Anderson, and we became uh, good friends. And then he was ordained three years before me, and I remember telling him, you can't leave me with these people. <laughs> uh, but I was here for his first Mass, I do remember that, and those three years flew by. Uh, and now to have him uh, receive an assignment uh, at the seminary, now we're, we're so close. So uh, that's been a really nice gift uh, in my life too. I know that it was he who the year before I entered, I entered the seminary in 2005. Uh, the year prior, he kind of headed a small committee to begin an annual JP2 Night of the Arts uh, to appreciate uh, the gift of art and beauty uh, to the world. And then that second year it began, that's when I had come in and he goes, oh, you, you gotta be part of this. Uh, you know, so uh, I took over after uh, he left and we, we passed it on. One of the greatest nights at the seminary, often in the fall, it's not mandatory, but it's a chance for both Bormeo, the college, and St. Mary's, uh, the graduate school, to kind of come together. Uh, by that point in the fall, you might not really know each other, but that night always brought us together. It didn't matter where you were in your formation or theology, it brought us together. And then the guys kind of bared their souls and hearts and just, uh, and I'll, 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 I'll share this uh, at one point tonight. JP2 says in his letter to artists that you can look at a work of art and it reveals something of the artist. Whether it's poetry, um, a work of fiction, um, a physical work of art, the work reveals something of the artist. And so that's what we saw that night, year after year. We saw these guys just bare their souls and then you didn't ever kind of quite look at them the same. And you're like, oh, that's that guy who can do that or did that. And it was a phenomenal night. Faculty, too. And so we're kind of glad to hear that uh, they've kept it going. Um, in recent enough years, especially given the pandemic and I think the great division that we experience, not only in this nation but around the world, beauty uh, truly will uh, save the world. It's the only thing that really keeps us from sinking into despair. Um, so I'm happy to kind of unpack all of that for us tonight before I get into the specific work of art, which was my master's defense at the seminary. It was the Pieta theology in stone. Um, and uh, I passed, so I fooled them. So maybe I can uh, fool all of you uh, tonight too. So when you defend your, your defense at the seminary, uh, you either fail uh, or pass. And even if you fail, you're allowed to come back in a week and give it another stab. Um, or you can pass with honors even. And none of us knows how you really do that. But uh, after you're done, uh, they, they send you out of the room and you get to pace while they deliberate and talk about you. Uh, and then the guy will who heads it will come in and welcome you back in. And if you pass, uh, there's, there's wine glasses with bottles of open wine ready to toast that you have passed. And I remember when I did walk in, I saw, I saw the wine, I'm like, okay, good. I just passed, this is over. Um, and I remember it was then Father Mike Woost, now Bishop Woost, and he said, um, Terry, congratulations, you passed with honors. <laughs> so that was a... <laughs> So I'll trust his verdict, hopefully uh, you do too. But before we begin, why don't we pause for a moment, recognizing we are constantly in the presence of God, um, and prepare ourselves for what's shared this evening. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, ever-present and faithful God, we ask your blessing upon us this evening. We ask you to strengthen our respective vocations in various ministries, and renew within each one of us all that we have promised and to which we have committed our lives. From the moment of the incarnation, 
the moment divinity took on flesh, giving the universe once and for all a true image of God, utilizing the goods and the resources of the earth, your creatures have rightly dared to depict your son and the mystery of the Trinity. Intimately tied to your son for all eternity is his mother. She whose yes changed the cosmos. Countless artists from every race and in every culture have portrayed her lovingly. She whom Dante contemplates among the splendors of paradise as beauty that was joy in the eyes of all the other saints. Permit her to intercede for us and throughout these remaining Lenten days. And may the talents of artists help to affirm that true beauty, which is a glimmer of the Spirit of God, will transfigure matter, opening the human soul to the sense of the eternal. We ask this as we do all things, the power of your Spirit, and in the name of your Son, Jesus, God, forever and ever. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. In the foreword of a 2019 book uh, entitled Beauty, What It Is and Why It Matters, the contributor writes, I still recall the young seminary student's reaction to entering the Cathedral of Notre Dame for the first time in 1972. So vast was the interior, so balanced the architecture, that he felt swept off his feet and thrust forward. Everything he saw pulled him up and away toward the sanctuary, a reminder that Gothic cathedrals were built to make a statement, anything beautiful does. Unhappy people do not construct buildings like this. No, they don't. And by extension, they bring happiness to the beholder as well. I cannot help but think that this happiness is based on the conviction that truth, beauty, and goodness exist, and that the art that endures is the art that surprises us with this shock of recognition. In a cynical world, this perspective is the needed antidote. Art attracts, and it does so by way of beauty. St. Thomas Aquinas's profoundly simple definition of beauty is that which pleases when seen. The wow moment, the sensation of being in the presence of something thrilling, something larger than ourselves, not something superficial but transcendent, something we never thought possible, this moment is the result of recognizing our human purpose. There is beauty in that moment, and the moment exists because of beauty. Surprise, as the result of an encounter with beauty, makes a connection that affirms both the human and the divine. It affirms balance, order, and a longing for the transcendent, because God is, after all, the God of order and never chaos. That wow moment came to me uh, after my graduation from high school between 97 and 98, when I first began undergrad studies in art history and came upon Michelangelo, specifically with his Pietà. Michelangelo, uh, whose birthday was just celebrated on the 6th of March, next year will mark 550 years for him. I plan on having a party at St. Noel next year. <laughs> this was a true Renaissance man. First and foremost, he always considered himself a sculptor, but he was also a painter, an architect, and a poet. And had he only executed one of his famous works, the pages of history would have secured a place for him. And not only for this work at the age of 26, but he was responsible for the David. He constructed this between the years of 1501 and 04. This came shortly after the Pietà. It's 17 feet tall. The marvel about this is, he was given the commission and received the stone 
uh, from a work that was already previously someone tried to execute something from it and if I have my information correct in my mind I think it was like a hundred years prior somebody tried to sculpt something out of this massive stone uh, and the no matter who attempted something at it the the response always was this stone is trash uh, you can't get anything out of it it doesn't sculpt well there's a bunch of flaws in the rock in the stone in the marble so even though somebody went at it however many times trying to sculpt something else I don't believe we even know what was trying to be sculpted he managed to execute the David from that rotten piece of marble. From 1508 to 12, the Sistine Chapel, that really sealed his reputation as the greatest master of the human figure. And 25 years later, between the years of 1536 and 41, he executed uh, the last judgment wall behind the main altar. That was completed at the age of 67. And in 1546, at the age of 71, Michelangelo became the chief architect of St. Peter's Basilica. There was an old St. Peter's we refer to at the time of Constantine, uh, after the 300s, once Christianity became legal to celebrate uh, publicly. Um, it was a wood frame church. And after almost 1,500 years, uh, wood frame, you might imagine, it was uh, deteriorating. And it was Julius II who uh, kind of mowed it down uh, and said, we will build something bigger and greater. The St. Peter's, you and I know, is the new St. Peter's. And what I learned in recent um, study was when he received the commission, it's written down that he wrote, what I do now, I do for the greater glory of God, to the honor of St. Peter, and for the salvation of my soul, never once accepting a penny for the commission. When we speak of beauty, beauty is more than in the eye of the beholder. Uh, it's greater than that. Uh, aesthetics, I believe, are in the eye of the beholder. You and I can look at different works, and you might like that, and I might like this. Even though it's experiential, and that remains different for all of us, there is such a thing as objective beauty. This is beautiful for everyone. And if you're in your right mind, you can't refute that. Simply put, it's not up for debate. True beauty affirms balance, order, and a longing for the transcendent. And again, it goes back to containing that element of surprise. Surprise is what makes us stand eyes wide open before a work like Michelangelo's Last Judgment. We close our eyes at the strains of a, a melody or we float weightlessly upon entering a medieval cathedral. Beauty remains so necessary for a fuller human life. A theologian living among us today, George Weigel, in his book, Letters to a Young Catholic, this is really a great read, recommend it. He writes, the Catholic spirit cannot live without beauty. The human spirit cannot live without beauty because beauty helps prepare us for eternity, to be the kind of people who can live with God forever. I always pose this question when I give various aspects of this presentation. Can you think of your favorite work of art? It doesn't have to be a painting. Again, it can be a work of fiction or nonfiction, a poem, a film, um, statuary, mosaic. What is your favorite work of art? And I pose the question because then I invite you to pay attention to that. Because that means there are hints of the eternal in it. When you can always return to it and never grow tired of it. Think of a song that comes on the radio and even though you, can, you have it committed to memory and you're the world's worst singer, you crank it up, you let the whole world hear. It's not like a church where we mumble or don't, uh, we're more embarrassed. When there's no audience, you always find, you don't get sick of it, you don't get tired of it. There are books people read more than once, certainly films people see more than once, who can recite them from memory. Pay attention to that. There's hints of the eternal in it. I loved when we went to my grandmother's uh, in North Olmsted. This is me and her and my mom next to 
Apparently your eyes are as big as they are when you're born. <laughs> and for me, she was just, she was beauty, uh, both um, interior uh, and exterior. I loved going over her house because she had the 64 pack of crayons with that built-in sharpener, and we only had the 48 pack at home. And all of ours were down to nothing, where the wrapper's already off of them. And I remember they were in this little cabinet at the foot of these steps that kind of sank into their living room, uh, sometimes with a new coloring book uh, waiting for us inside. And she had this large statue of Mary uh, on top of that cabinet. And I remember telling my sister uh, how we had to be careful around the nice lady. Uh, and I remember my sister, ever the skeptic, asked, how do you know she's nice? <laughs> well, one, uh, I knew that Graham liked her, so that was enough for me. Um, but I said, well, she's stepping on the bad snake. Oh, I was supposed to hit the crayons there. Yeah. <laughs> In elementary school, I always wondered why we had to have math every day, but art was once a week. And I remember in Highlights Magazine, I loved the things to make page toward the back. And in second grade, I loved when we were told uh, by Miss Barnard, uh, we were going to write and illustrate our own children's book. It had to have a cover, and it was going to be 10 pages long. And we had to have several characters and develop that. Uh, and mine was Duck Couldn't Swim. Uh, as you can see, my blue marker was running out. Uh, and this was before that pastel set of eight came out, so the elephant had to be blue. There was no gray marker then. And I remember her saying that she was going to laminate the covers. And I knew once you laminated something, that was that. You couldn't do anything uh, to it. And I remember this kid next to me said, you know, I heard if you take the back of the marker off and you run the, the, the pigment from the inside in that little car underwater, it'll reactivate it. That was a horrible mistake. It just got it runnier. It was horrible. It was totally ruined. And I remember this girl who sat next to me on the other side, Karen Sanders, uh, she had a brand new set. And I remember like watching the teacher, I don't know why I always thought I was going to get in trouble, but uh, just watching her uh, and leaning over and very quietly, very gently saying, um, can I borrow your blue marker? <laughs> to which she replied, no. <laughs> and I was nice to her, okay? I remember her book was about a farm or a barn or something like that, because every other day it was, how's my fence, how's my cow, how's my silo, how's my, you know, chicken? Oh, it's nice, it looks good. It, it looked horrible. It didn't look like any of those things. <laughs> but I wanted to be nice. I went to public school, and so second grade, you're preparing for your first Holy Communion, and so in preparation for that, you're making your first reconciliation, and I remember... Uh, uh, them handing us this, it had to have been a legal size sheet of paper, mimeographed with that purple ink, copied crooked, looked like it was faxed twice, run over by a truck, um, FedExed home, and recopied. Um, only a graphic designer and artist would think of that in second grade, that there's a problem with this uh, format. Uh, and it was typed by the typewriter, where it was like click, flap, like, you know, uh, before electronic. But it was supposed to help you with preparing for your first reconciliation. So I remember it would have, the, I think it had the act of contrition at the bottom so that in case we didn't have it memorized. Um, and it had things like, I lied blank amount of times, I swore blank amount of times, I disobeyed my parents blank amount of times, da 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 da. I was a fairly good kid. So a lot of mine were like zero, 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 zero. I'm not sure if that was true, but that was how I examined my conscience. But, um, and then I remember thinking, like, and they didn't really tell you anything back then. It was like, you're going in this dark room, you're going to kneel down on this thing, that's going to tell Father you're there, but he's going to be talking to somebody else on the other side, and he opens up the window, and then when you see, hear him clearly, that's your turn. And I could hear him with the, I'm like, is it, do I go? Is, is, uh, do I say the zeros? If it's zero, do I skip it? You know, just, it was, hopefully we're doing a much better job about this uh, now. Um, so I think I remember saying, I better just say it in case. So it was zero, 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 zero. And then I got to one that said, I looked at bad pictures blank amount of times. And I'm like, well, it's 10 pages. They're all horrible how she drew them. I looked at at least 10 bad pictures. Um, again, only an artist would confess looking at bad art is a sin. What did I know what a bad picture was uh, then? To top that off, my mom found that sheet in my book bag. So, so much for the uh, anonymity of uh, confession. And I re Without knowing what any of this meant, I do remember her saying to my dad that night, what is he looking at? Where is he getting this? 
And he's like, I have no idea. There's nothing in this house. I remember him saying that, again, not knowing what that was. And they both come to me and they're like, what bad pictures are you looking at? And I'm bawling and I don't know why. And where you kind of like you're crying and trying to talk at the same time. And I was like, she's a terrible drawer. She sits right next to me. She, I looked at her 10 bad pictures in her book. They're like, oh, never mind. OK. <laughs> That's my first confession. <laughs> So I can only imagine what that priest, Father Jim Masofsky, thought on the other side, zero, 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 ten bad pictures. Um, I am convinced that had I not been born into a Catholic family, uh, that I probably would have later converted. I think just on the art alone. Uh, the art is what I know would have drawn me into the faith. And in a certain sense, that's exactly what it's meant to do. Beauty leads to the good and the true. Those three are forever connected. They don't outdo each other. They don't rank. They complement one another. They're forever with one another. I think we've all heard those kind of comments when we have those faith discussions with people, whether within the church or outside the church. You'll get the comment, you know, who are you to tell me how to behave or what to believe? Or how can you be so arrogant as to think you should impose your thought patterns on me? Which is exactly why moralizing and intellectualizing even they are often non-starters in regard to any persuasion when it comes to the faith. But there is something unthreatening about the beautiful. And so start with beauty, and that will always lead to the true and the good. Think of the Sistine Chapel ceiling, or the Parthenon. Read an epic work like Dante's Divine Comedy or Hamlet. Chartres Cathedral in France. It's worth noting that during the war, the Second War, for fear of damage of this space and these uh, windows, every pane was removed, buried, and hidden and numbered, knowing full well if the building received damage, they could never replace it. And then after the war, everything was unearthed, cleaned, re matched where it went, and reinstalled. You don't just do that with anything. Or how about more than five years ago now, or five years now, when it was Holy Week, and we were looking on our screens that Monday and watching Notre Dame burn before our eyes. We don't get upset about that kind of destruction over just anything. Any destruction, yes, of course, is, um, has that difficulty uh, and that lament. But in addition to these works in these places, think about Mother Teresa's sisters still working in the slums of Calcutta. That's beauty. The movements of a ballet dancer, the, the, the ideal form of both male and female, and the movement of the body, God's greatest work of art, man and woman, and all of these work a sort of transformation in the soul. And they awaken a desire to participate, to imitate, and then finally to share. Hansers von Balthasar, who was a Swiss theologian and a Catholic priest, who was to be created a cardinal but died before the ceremony in 1988, he's one of the great advocates of the aesthetic approach to religion. And he said that the beautiful claims the viewer, changes him, and then sends him on mission. Bishop Robert Barron states, the pattern is more or less as follows. First, the beautiful. And our response is, how wonderful. Tell me about this. Then the good. I want to participate in that. And then finally, the true. Now I understand. Before getting into any specific work, to talk about sacred art, I think you have to begin by saying all of sacred art has a twofold purpose. Uh, first, it adorns sacred space, architecture, with beauty. And all of this is done in an effort to raise our minds, hearts, and souls upon entering a sacred space and help focus our attention throughout the celebration of the liturgy or the Mass. Second, it served as a tool to teach. Because for the most part, in the early centuries of the Church, the faithful were largely illiterate. They could not read or write. And so all the imagery that we find in frescoes and mosaics, paintings, sculpture, and stained glass windows, they served to teach uh, the biblical stories, the lives of Christ and his mother, and the lives 
of the saints. You had to get the theology right because you were teaching the faithful. The Catholic Church is unmatched in her regard for art, for beauty. And truly, because the church was in that unique position to have patrons, because of the gospel, spreading the gospel, that art and music and the sciences, they are all where they are today because of the church. The church is arguably owner, author, patron, and creator of the world's greatest works of art. There's truth and goodness in these works, and equated with truth and goodness forever is beauty. And for me, too, I knew my faith was always important to me. Uh, add to that my inclination toward the world of art. Um, it wasn't until I began to discern the priesthood and when I entered the seminary in 05 that I was first exposed to the church's regard, thought, reflection, and all of her documents on art and beauty throughout the centuries. For me then, I finally had this language to wed these two great loves of mine and learned rather quickly that if I were called to the priesthood, I wouldn't be giving anything up as far as pursuing a career as an artist, but that art and beauty uh, would pervade all aspects of ministry. And as far as priest presiders go, uh, I understood pretty quick uh, that having a good sense of liturgy, what does the church ask of us? What is the church's vision for how things are celebrated? Uh, a solid mastery of the prescribed prayers for the day, I think especially since the new translation because that language is very poetic. Uh, proclaiming well the scriptures, formulating and delivering well a good homily, and even an awareness of our own movement. Uh, some of the things we get graded on in the seminary, mostly among our peers, if anything, like, do you know you do this all the time? Like, you shift your weight or you use your hands too much. or you do... All of that, if we're not told, if we're unaware, can become a distraction. You can deliver the greatest homily known to man, but if you're a distraction to that, nobody's, nobody's listening. So to have an awareness of self... Um, the use of well-designed programs and worship aids, things that foster our participation. Uh, the use of live floral arrangements. Uh, and why live, even though there's an extra cost with that? Because anything artificial speaks nothing of the Paschal mystery. There is no dying and rising. Um, when something beautiful is placed before us from creation uh, to enhance our celebration, always to complement, never for its own reason, um, always considering the space. We don't decorate our churches, or we should not decorate our churches the way we decorate a Macy's window or our homes at Christmas. Um, hopefully our churches are beautiful enough in their own right, no matter the style, that there isn't too much you really have to do with them. You can dress it up, but never for its own sake. It should complement well the space. But to put something beautiful that's alive in front of you and to know that within a week or two it's going to wilt, no matter what you do to attend to it, it's going to die, it's going to decay, it offered its beauty to the world, that speaks of the Paschal mystery, a dying and rising. Uh, never, now I don't know anything here, so don't get mad at me if you have this here, <laughs> but the ideal would be to not use anything electric when it comes to candles, uh, because what does an electric candle do? It might give light, but it is artificial, but a candle, a true candle, uh, offers both light, authentic light, and heat and warmth, and Christ is so much uh, always referred to as the light of the world. So to be authentic as possible uh, in our celebration, all of that matters. All of it contributes to the faithful being drawn into what they are, are there to celebrate, that gather to give thanks and praise to God, an aspect of God's presence is made known to them. This is truly the whole sacramental uh, principle of the church, making visible the invisible. It's why the stuff of the earth, aspects of God's creation, are used in the sacraments and in the various rites of the church. Uh, water, wine, bread, fire, oil. We're told in the seminary right off the bat, matter matters. Incense, paper, fabric, color, art, music, our sense of touch, taste, smell, hearing, and sight. Ideally, all of it engages to make something of God's presence known. What's the first thing we do when we walk into a church? We touch holy water, and then we touch our bodies. We bless our bodies. We cross our bodies. We genuflect. We kneel. We bow simply and profoundly. We sit and we stand. Uh, because we don't just pray with our words. 
we pray with our very bodies. Even our bodies are sacramental. Our bodies represent uh, an invisible reality. Our bodies give sight to an invisible reality. And so we don't just pray with our words, we pray with our very bodies. I know that often when given any of this type of discussion, the question is begged, what of all the church's wealth, magnificence, and opulence? Shouldn't the Vatican sell all that it has and give it to the poor? This question is answered basically in two ways. Uh, the first is from Scripture, when our Lord says, you will always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. The church could, in fact, sell all that it has, and it would still never be enough to provide for the poor. So we have to, um, as we are commissioned at the end of every Mass, as we are dismissed, sent on mission, go forth, the Mass is ended, go in peace, go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your life, go and announce the gospel of the Lord. They all start with go, which some of you don't get. <laughs> I'm mostly teasing. Um, but that idea that, I remember the question was posed to us in the seminary, what is the most important part of the Mass? And nearly all of us said the Eucharist, then some said scriptures, and then Father Mike Woost kind of shook his head lovingly and said, it is the dismissal. You and I can gather week after week and do what we're supposed to do, and if there's no effect, we do all of this in vain. The dismissal, that great commissioning at every Mass is the most important. Social institutions, cultures, and human hearts certainly need to change to even begin to tackle the injustices of, uh, of poverty. And I think Pope Francis has the world's attention uh, several years ago by opening up the Vatican to the poor on a regular basis for food and showering, all of that dignity that comes with the human person. The second point would be pieces like the David, the Pieta, and all that is contained within the Vatican museums and all the liturgical objects used at Mass, however simple or ornate, those are not for private ownership. Uh, they are for the world. The founder of the Congregation of the Blessed Sacrament, uh, who's now canonized and feted by the Church as the Apostle of the Eucharist, when establishing houses of public Eucharistic adoration, he insisted that these, quote, cenacles, the oases, not only of prayer, but also of beauty. If you think about it, the gospel tells us that for the Last Supper, Jesus chose a large, furnished room. It's kind of an astounding thing because Jesus always sought out poor houses and uh, here we find a kind of uh, sumptuousness and that is because for the Eucharist, nothing is too beautiful. And this sentiment inspired that founder's quest to dedicate creative genius in architecture, painting, and sculpture, all for the honor of the Blessed Sacrament. All of this is to prepare us for eternity, again, to be the kind of people who can live with God forever. Uh, just a note, this is the interior of St. Peter's Dome, the largest dome on earth, uh, designed by Michelangelo. And in his own lifetime, he only saw what's referred to as the drum of the dome, all of those arches, uh, the ribs uh, were not completed until 40 years later. Um, anything you see in St. Peter's that has color, none of it is painted. This is all mosaic. And the thing with that is mosaic lasts. The other thing it does is it reflects light. If you go to the interior of St. Peter's on the cloudiest day, you will take the greatest picture you have ever taken. You cannot take a bad picture in St. Peter's. The way the light pours in. And when you think about it, when we walk into these sacred spaces, and it doesn't have to be St. Peter's, what happens when we're, our attention is drawn upward and we're in awe? We're looking up. Our necks are strained. Our, our eyes get tired. We're looking up and we're not doing this, which is all we do anymore. This is our world. And the head is down. And we're not engaged when you walk into a sacred space like that, it's that wow moment. When you are drawn to a work of art, be it painting, sculpture, music, poetry, architecture, when you can look at it or listen to it and never grow tired of it, pay attention to that. 
It means there are hints of the eternal in it. It fosters devotion, and it is preparing you for eternity. As I mentioned, one of the main purposes of art was to teach the faithful who were largely illiterate. Paintings, even the architecture of sacred space, was meant to be read. Uh, for you and I, who feel we might be gifted with higher and higher degrees of education, uh, I think this is largely lost on us, and we tend to just glance at paintings or works of art, be it in church or a museum, and we might say, like, oh, isn't that nice, uh, or I love this, uh, or I don't care for that, or this doesn't speak to me. It's not a question of style. Sacred art is laden with theology, and these works were meant to be read almost more than seen. And to draw home all of this, I would like to focus on Michelangelo's Pietà. Pietà is an Italian word. It means pity or sorrow, and it's just the name of a work given uh, that image of Christ in his mother's arms before uh, the entombment. This was first commissioned as a tomb for a French cardinal, and the Vatican Pietà is surely the most universally loved work of the Renaissance artist. Uh, one author writes, this is Michelangelo's tremendousness, excelling even the Sistine Chapel. Another commentator notes, the Sistine Chapel reveals artistic grandeur. The Pietà portrays simple faith. There is sanctity in that statue. The contract for the Pietà, it still exists. It's dated the 27th of August in 1498. And among several details worked out between the artist and the patron, it states, it is to be a sculpture of the Madonna with the body of her son after the deposition from the cross. And it is to be the most beautiful work of art in all of Rome. That's in the contract. He certainly delivered. It's said that the marble around her veil is carved almost so thin, light almost pervades it. And here, in this supreme gesture, Mary's outstretched hand not only demonstrates her acceptance of the divine will, but presents to us the price of our salvation. This is still her yes at the Annunciation. This is still her fiat. This is still her, let it be done to me according to your will. Many artists and sculptors state that any other uh, master would have kept her fingers kind of webbed in the stone, connected to one another. But his creative mind and masterful skill gives dignity to each finger, and in doing so, communicates a fuller sign of her submission and her presentation, the presentation of her son to us, the price of our salvation. In Pope John Paul II's letter to artists, which was released in 1999, it was released on Easter Sunday of that year. You can go to the Vatican website and look it up. John Paul himself was an artist, uh, an actor, uh, before entering the seminary, and it's reported that when he told his group of friends he was entering the seminary, he broke every girl's heart. <laughs> In his uh, masterful letter, he affirms that artworks not only reveal something regarding the human condition, but in addition, as I shared before we began, reveal something about the artist himself. When gazing upon his or her work, the viewer is given the opportunity to know something of the artist's inner life. And the girl-like face of the Virgin of his Pietà not only makes evident his unmatched skill in manipulating the marble, but more clearly exhibits his faith as a believer. When it was unveiled on Christmas Day in 1499, he was immediately accused of having carved an unsuitably young face on the mother of what would have been or is believed to be a 33-year-old son. The artist is reported to having said without hesitation, don't you know that those who remain pure retain their youth? How much more might this pertain to her? For if God bestowed on her a singular grace in preserving her from the stain of original sin and kept her body free from the corruption of the grave, could he not then have kept her also from the ravages 
of age. The Pietà translates into marble then the words of Dante when he wrote in Paradise, he referred to Mary as daughter of your son. That's a paradox. You can't be the daughter of your son, and yet she is because he existed for all eternity. Took on human flesh over 2,000 years ago, but what do we say every week in the creed? God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. This is the only work he ever signed in the sash that runs across her chest. Um, again, it was, um, after it was unveiled, uh, the work was attributed to other artists, thinking this 26-year-old could not have done this. And so by candlelight, he snuck into the old St. Peter's. So that's something else to mention. When this work was finished, the old St. Peter's was still uh, in place. Um, he carved across her chest, Michelangelo Bonarotti, uh, the Florentine, made this. He wanted the world to know someone from Florence, his hometown, made this and that it was uh, him. It's said that he later regretted it, but there it is. He received the commission at the age of 24 when that contract was drawn up. It took him a year to find the marble he would use. Almost every day for a year, he went to the quarries in Florence searching for the best piece. And he said he always went in the early morning because the early morning sunlight gave away a marble's imperfections. These quarries are still in existence today. And those quarrymen say, never since Michelangelo's Pietà has a more pure block been excavated from these quarries. And what an important thing. He took a year to find the block. And had he not taken that kind of care, if there was an imperfection in the marble in the middle or anywhere, there was a vein or um, it was corrupted in some way. He could have been carving this beautiful thing and then one false move and then the arm falls off or we never saw it or is never realized. The material itself, beautiful. And he took that time. How impatient are we today? We have become impatient with beauty. We want everything now. I was at two Catholic goods stores today. Sorry to say this out loud. I always call it bad Catholic art. I'm like, we can do better than this. We have a copyright almost on beauty. And this is what we're putting out, uh, whether it's illustrated stories from scriptures, um, trying to find cards for our RCIA. I'm like, I'm just going to do something myself. I can't stand this. We can do better. Um, we have grown impatient. Everything is copied. Um, everything is cookie cutter. Um, and that beautiful photorealism uh, from the Baroque era and the Renaissance, we don't have time for it. We don't wait for these commissions. Um, beauty takes time. Uh, beauty takes resources. Uh, and it takes um, patience. And we have grown impatient. In fact, when he was working on the Sistine Chapel, and if you've seen the agony and the ecstasy, uh, it's, 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 retallied in the, it's retold in the book as well. You know, the Pope was always like, when will you make an end of it? And his response from the scaffolding was always, when I am finished. Some of you might remember that in 1962, uh, John XXIII approved the request of the Archbishop of New York to have the Pieta brought to the New York World's Fair between the years of 64 and 65. Does anyone remember this happening? Did anyone go? Oh, some hands. My pastor growing up at Holy Spirit, Father James Beatty, God rest him, I remember him telling me, uh, my grandmother and I took the train to New York and we saw Michelangelo's Pieta. Now John the 23rd died on the 3rd of June in 63 and it was reported that Pope Paul the Sixth had serious reservations about the loan to the United States. But as an act of good faith, uh, he kept his predecessor's permission. Also, what's going on during that time? Uh, this is all in the light of the Second Vatican Council. It was still in session. He really wanted to convey uh, for the world the church's relevance in the modern era. 
I see these images and I can't believe this was ever done. It was on the 14th of April in 1964, a headline in the New York Times read, the Pieta arrives here ever so gently. And the opening paragraph read, Michelangelo's masterwork in marble, the Pieta, arrived in New York yesterday, the first time it has ever left the Vatican since the sculptor smuggled it into the old St. Peter's in a horse-drawn cart 465 years ago. And there was this great fear that the slightest jar might kind of split the aged marble of the massive work. Uh, shippers had packed the Pieta in a watertight case, inside of a case, inside of another case. We're Catholic, we do things in threes. <laughs> <laughs> this is a poor image, but you can see the top of her head uh, sticking out of the, the crate. The priceless statue was packed in a heavy wooden case and cushioned with millions of tiny uh, polystyrene beads. And even if the Italian lines Christopher Colombo, the ship that carried the masterpiece from Italy, had sunk, the container would have floated. Uh, and the top of the container was even painted a bright orange so that it could be spotted easily. Can you imagine being in Rome and seeing this happen? In fact, I've given this presentation other times and I said, um, can you imagine, as an American, finally making that trip to Rome between 64 and 65 and <laughs> walking into St. Peter's being like, sorry folks, <laughs> she's in New York. <laughs> I said that once. And a woman came up to me after, me, my husband and I. <laughs> and even if the container, through some mischance, had sunk even 10 feet below the surface, there was electronic equipment within the case which would have radioed its position in the ocean. I understand, too, that a second ship sailed alongside of it in case anything happened. There had been left no room for error. Uh, and that buoyant uh, cushioning material inside the cases, it was considered sufficient to protect it. Uh, even if a cable had snapped on the crane that lifted the crate from the deck uh, of the, the ship uh, to the deck of the barge. And with its packing case, the Pieta weighed 11,600 pounds. That's nearly six tons. And the 120 foot boom on the derrick, uh, it can lift 90 tons. So there was this huge, large margin of safety. And all of this care was in very sharp contrast with the night when Michelangelo and his friends, fearful that Pope Alexander VI might refuse permission for installation of the statue in St. Peter's, uh, made their secret entrance into the Vatican, the Pieta was bedded in straw and covered by old blankets. That's how they brought it in. Now, the ship was named Christopher Columbus. You think about it, too. This was the beautiful thing about art history, um, and it's history for a reason, because it, it presents these works alongside what's going on in history. So Columbus was a contemporary of Michelangelo. They lived at the same time. Uh, but that explorer never got the welcome that the Pieta did when he arrived in the New World. Um, there were three red tugboats bearing signs, New York welcomes Pieta. And it was escorted by the Christopher Colombo up New York Bay to her Hudson River berth at West 44th Street. Upon its arrival, New York detectives had boarded from a cutter in the lower bay, and so had dignitaries of the Roman Catholic Church and rigging experts of Merritt, Chapman, and Scott, Inc. For those who went, this is what you were looking at. This is how they chose uh, to feature it against this deep blue backdrop with uh, the piece illuminated from above. Uh, and this is worth uh, mentioning something here. When a sculptor received a commission, uh, they always had to know uh, where will the piece be? Because you had to sculpt it in such a way, especially 500 years ago, no electricity. So you relied on the sunlight uh, and candlelight to illumine any work. Uh, and so this was, uh, again, it was gonna be for a French cardinal's tomb. Uh, poor guy never got it, um, uh, thankfully. Uh, it's for the world. Um, it was to be in this niche this chapel in the old St. Peter's where there was, um, as it kind of tries to echo here, um, an, an oculus uh, in the chapel that let sunlight uh, pour in. And it would have illumined Christ's body. Uh, the fact that, yes, he's dead in this moment, but he is the light of the world. The body is illumined. Um, and you can really see that here. 
how do we see her now, or how do we see it now? We tend to see her, and he's almost lost uh, the way it's uh, situated now. Um, but he would have sculpted it with that in mind, that the body would have been illumined uh, from above. Uh, during those years, it was seen by more than 27 million visitors, uh, and its mission accomplished, the marble group returned to the Basilica of St. Peter just as intact as it had left, and afterward, Paul VI said, it would never be lent out again and would remain at the Vatican, period. And rightfully so. And then, on the 21st of May in 1972, a Hungarian-born Australian geologist, Laszlo Toth, jumped the altar railing and dealt 12 hammer blows before he could be pulled off, severely damaging the Renaissance masterpiece. Her left arm and hand were knocked off at the elbow. All I can think of is he must have rolled in his grave. He also broke her nose in three places and left about a hundred fragments, including chips from the back of her veiled head. Unfortunately, some fragments were taken by bystanders that day, and it required some of the restoration to be taken from the back of the piece. Uh, and I remember, I, I believe I have this right, uh, there was uh, an announcement made, uh, a plea uh, from the Vatican that said, please, if you took anything that day, simply return it, no questions asked. We just need it back to help us to fathom to begin this, this restoration. And after that attack, some art historians and restorers wanted the statue to remain as it was um, damaged as a sign of the violent times. Others said it should be restored, but with clear marks delineating the damage uh, as part of a historical testament. And that's kind of a general rule in art history. When a work is, suffers damage, uh, you kind of leave it alone. Because uh, how do you dare um, recreate the resources used? Um, even if you can get the pigment perfect, Paint is different 500 years later. Um, it's aged 500 years. Uh, with all the irony in the world, in the Sistine Chapel ceiling, uh, the, the image, the panel depicting the flood, uh, has severe water damage, and they just plastered over it. Um, they didn't try to recreate uh, that scene, even if we have drawings or sketches or, or photography uh, of it. In the end, the Vatican decided on what's known as an integral restoration one that would not leave any traces of the intervention visible to the naked eye. This is a great picture because with the two guys there, the two scientists, the two restorers, uh, it shows you just how large this is. It is larger uh, than life. In fact, if she were to stand up, she'd be over six feet tall. With any other statue, leaving the wounds of the attack visible, however painful, could have been tolerated, uh, said the director of the Vatican Museums at the time. But he wrote, not with the Pieta, not this miracle of art. And what took Michelangelo a year to sculpt at the turn of the 16th century, it took the Vatican Museum experts a year to restore uh, in all its splendor. As Hans Urs von Balthasar once wrote, the more you and I know and love and understand a great work of art, the more we recognize that we can't, in the final analysis, grasp its genius. That's why we never tire of a beloved work of art. And in no other example than the Pieta could I find Weigel's sentiment to be more true. This is a perfect work of compliments. Um, they're not competing with one another, which is all we tend to do anymore, men and women against each other. This is a perfect work of compliment. Man and woman, a mother and child, dead and living, clothed and naked, uh, her body on the vertical axis, his on the horizontal. Robert Barron recently in a, a really great video on this piece kind of suggests uh, Mary is a mountain uh, and Christ's body is like a river uh, that just uh, conforms to her body. Um, he points out too uh, that this is totally a Eucharistic piece, especially where it was originally intended to be an altarpiece behind an altar. Uh, so as uh, the celebrant elevates the host and the chalice, uh, what's behind him 
this image of the body of Christ, her almost pouring him out uh, onto the altar, this last uh, act of love from her, this, this presentation of the price of our salvation. And he points out, too, that uh, she holds him, but only indirectly. Her outstretched hand isn't touching him, and where she is on the side, her garment is in between. And he suggests, um, much like when benediction is offered and the, the priest uh, or the deacon elevates uh, the monstrance with that humeral veil, um, there's something in between. Uh, so touches it, but only indirectly. She is presenting him uh, to us the way the host is presented to us in a moment of adoration uh, and worship. What's unique about this piece as well, and when I give, I give a version of this that will last three days, so you guys are getting the hour uh, long, uh, almost hour and five minutes. Um, we didn't start exactly at uh, 6.30, right? Okay, all right. Um, the beauty of this piece, not only how he chose to execute it, but there was a great awkwardness when it came, if you look up Pieta by any other artist, it's awkward. Um, how do you dare depict uh, the body of a grown man over the lap of this woman? and it doesn't uh, feel weird or look odd, or and maybe even the way they chose to depict the body, rigor mortis has already set in, and so Christ's body often has these sharp, uh, jutting limbs you know, from her body. All of it is meant to echo back to what do we get at Christmas time, those cards with the Madonna and child, you know, that uh, she's holding him, she's presenting him uh, to us. Um, but this uh, is meant to echo back uh, to that moment, but how do you make that beautiful? Well, he solves it by making Mary, like I said, a pyramid, uh, with her head at the apex, and then her gown is just um, exaggerated uh, with these um, folds and folds uh, of her garment, but it acts as a receptacle almost to, uh, for his body, to contain uh, his body. And um, uh, he who the world cannot contain, uh, she contained him uh, within her womb. Uh, so she is forever presenting him uh, to us. Lots of times, too, if you look at a Madonna and child, again, because the theology had to be right, she's presenting him to us, it doesn't mean always, uh, but if the artist knew uh, his or her theology, uh, look at Mary's gaze and look at where Christ is looking. Christ is always looking at the viewer. She's often looking down or looking up or off to the side. Uh, she's forever presenting him to us. She would never make it about her. She'd be the first one to admit that. Um, much like John the Baptist, he must increase, I must decrease. So all of those little things are uh, truly uh, theology captured in the piece. So beauty, it prepares us for eternity. And whether it's sculpture, painting, or architecture, beauty prepares us for what we're headed for. And I think the question is, especially in this day and age, do we recognize it when we see it? This piece just before, it's by a French artist, William Bouguereau, uh, who uh, painted at the turn of the previous century, late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, what's going on at the time that was popular? Uh, French Impressionism. Uh, so this was not popular, and he was often shunned uh, from galleries. And in reviews in the paper, uh, it wouldn't be uncommon uh, for somebody to write, um, Mr. Bouguereau constantly does the same thing and we're tired of it. His work is too perfect. And in another uh, rebuttal in the paper a week later, I believe someone wrote, don't you understand? You just paid the artist the highest compliment you could. His work is too perfect. Do we recognize beauty? And that was uh, almost, what, 200 years ago? Robert Barron, I believe, poses it the best. He suggests, again, that we begin with beauty, something that we can all appreciate as human beings. And he gives this a great example of a baseball game growing up. He goes, growing up, what do you fall in love with first? The rules, the plays, the strategy? He's like, no, you're drawn to the beauty of the game, the flow of the game. It captures your attention. Uh, you might even have to figure out what's going on, what's, what's the... Um, idea here, what's the goal, what's the objective, but you're drawn to the beauty and the flow of the game. 
It's only after approaching and appreciating that that we begin uh, to learn about all the rules and strategy. And the same applies to our faith. So first, let's attend to the beautiful, then the good, and then the true. Because you and I, with the time we're given, uh, we're called to make of our lives a masterpiece, a work of living art. And so how do we make ourselves beautiful in a vain world? Uh, by living a virtuous life, the good, and by conforming our lives to the truth. And when you and I cooperate with God's grace, we make of our lives that living work of art. And in doing so, we make incarnational, we make visible, the invisible, that which is true, good, and beautiful. When this piece was unveiled on Christmas Day in 1499, those who believed he did it uh, said to him right away, how on earth did you do this? Think of any 26-year-old you know today. How was this achieved? Yes, he had to be an artist, but this is beyond art. This is divine inspiration. Uh, this is the working of the Holy Spirit. Uh, this is his mind and hands being guided uh, from above. And it's reported that he said, in response to that question, how on earth did you do this? He goes, don't you know, that image was always contained in the stone. My job was simply to remove the excess. Think about that imagery from scripture about God being the potter and we are the clay. We have everything in us that we need to be beautiful in the true sense. But we have to allow God to kind of chip away at that. Because over time, through our fallen state, we pick up bad habits, we respond terribly to people, uh, to one another, to ourselves. Um, do we love ourselves? Do we love our neighbor? How is our relationship with God? Are we reconciled? We pick up defense mechanisms. Sometimes we don't even uh, think of the words that escape our lips, whether we're in our cars in traffic or with someone right before us. Think about, too, the most annoying person you know. I posed this in a homily one time. You don't think you're annoying? You are. <laughs> Someone finds you annoying. But that means you're annoying to them, too, probably, in some regard. None of us is off the hook. And when our lives are at last asked of us, there's going to be no more hiding, no more excuses. We're going to know. I believe in that moment of judgment we're going to know how we made everyone feel. And we're going to have an eternity uh, to reflect upon that. What do you need to allow God to chip away at? What do you need to start doing? What do you need to stop doing? I pose the question to myself as well. What bad habits do we have to let go of? What new good habits do we have to uh, begin? Do people see in us Christ? Or do we get in the way? Because that's the truth of our baptism. We become another Christ. My ordination did not make me another Christ. My baptism did. We all share in Christ's threefold uh, mission of priest, prophet, and king. With the time we are given, how are we working on that? And that's what this whole season is about. That we can magnify ourselves so that you and I can renew our baptismal promises on either at the Easter Vigil or on Easter Sunday. Will you be able to name for yourself, how am I different on Ash Wen from Ash Wednesday to this moment when we're asked to offer all those big, hearty I do's? Do you reject Satan? I do. Do you believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth? I do. I remember as, at this point in Lent, I shared this over the weekend, again, Father Mike Woost, uh, posing a question to us in a homily at the seminary saying, gentlemen, How's your Lent going? Have you been fantastic at what you resolved? Have you failed miserably? Lent is not so much about how you did here and there. It's all about how you finish. We have about a week and a half left, two weeks solid. How will you choose to finish? Even if you have to start now. 
even if you haven't been paying attention along the way or doing anything or, or giving up anything, so to speak, how will you choose to change that now so that when we do offer our I do's, it's with such conviction that God has chiseled away something that doesn't need to be there anymore to reveal the beauty of who you are, a beloved daughter or son of God. We get so mixed up today, and that's truly our only truth. By virtue of our baptism, we're a beloved daughter or son of God. Everything else is a fantastic detail. But our basic truth is, our identity is, I'm a beloved son or daughter of God. Which is why I believe Madonna has at least one thing right. Beauty's where you find it. Can you believe this song is over 30 years old? <laughs> Given that, though, I believe I'll leave us with perhaps a more uh, consistently credible source, and that is uh, from the Renaissance master. He himself said, The true work of art is but a shadow of the divine perfection. Whatever the greatest work is, it is this sliver of what we're headed for. Everything you find and experience to be beautiful, it's just a hint of what has been prepared for us. That beautiful passage uh, from 1 Corinthians, eye has not seen and ear has not heard, nor has it entered the human heart what God has prepared for those who love him. Why then, with the time we are given, do any of us hesitate to conform and adhere to all that has been handed on to us, helping to ensure all that was promised to us on the day of our baptism? May you and I fully enter into these remaining Lenten days, preparing our hearts and souls well for Easter, the great feast, celebrating the risen Christ, the mystery of the incarnation, when humanity was given a true image of God, the invisible God made visible, taking on our humanity so that you and I could become divine. Didn't I tell you so? <laughs> well. See, I like to be right once in a while, but this Lent I was right four times, four tremendous speakers and a very moving presentation. I'm still shaking from Father Terry. So thank you very much. And now will you give us your priestly blessing? The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go and announce the gospel of the Lord. Thank you, God. Just to plug down the street at Mount Carmel, uh, Father uh, Eric Garris is talking tonight, but tomorrow Father Andy Turner is, and then on Thursday, Father uh, Eric, uh, no, uh, Michael um, Gurnick. How can I forget Father Gurnick? Okay, and uh, so please uh, take advantage of that if you're looking for more Lenten input uh, this Lent. And uh, I want to thank Father Terry again. That was really great. Better than I expected. <laughs> but I expected a lot because I've already heard of his reputation. And uh, so... We've been blessed, haven't we, this Lent? We really have. And we're looking forward next year. This time of year will only be the first week of Lent. And uh, I have the Fathers of Mercy lined up to give a kind of old-fashioned parish mission. So that'll be like over five nights, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So that's a little different kind of experience, and, uh, but we'll always treasure this week and this month, these four speakers that we've had. Thanks again.